and um, hand it over to Mundy. Great, thank you, Megan. Can, can you hear me okay? Can you hear me, Megan? Yes, I can. Okay, great. So um, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am Mundy Wilson Piper. I'm a tree fund trustee and I'm involved with the communications committee. Uh, please forgive my croaky voice. I have a bad cold I haven't been able to get over, um, so I, I won't be long um, in this introduction of Tree Fund. Tree Fund was uh, established, many of you know, in 2002 with the mission to support scientific discovery and dissemination of new knowledge in the fields of arboriculture and urban forestry. We advance our mission by uh, issuing research grants, primarily applied research in how to better plant, propagate, and care for urban trees, not forests, providing scholarships to students in arboriculture, urban forestry, horticulture, and related fields, and funding education for kids in K through 12 grades related to trees and environmental stewardship. In 2018, $305,000 was awarded for new grants. $135,000 was paid toward long-term grants awarded in prior years. And $200,000 was donor designated to endowment funds for future grants. This is how the Tree Fund raises money for the grants and scholarships that we support through individual donations, endowment earnings, partnerships, community engagement events like Tour de Trees, and legacy giving. These are the areas of research we focus on, and over $4 million has been awarded since 2002 in the areas of root and soil management, plant health care, urban forestry, technology transfer, risk assessment, and worker safety propagation, planting, and establishment. We have several research grant lines at a variety of funding levels throughout the year. You can find information about all of these, including the application periods on our website, our new website, treefund.org. We're excited to offer two new research grants in the fall of 2019. The Sierra supports projects which will help arborists and urban foresters communicate the value of trees and urban forests on a national basis through technology transfer and engagement with developers, builders, civil engineers, city planners, elected officials, and other policy makers. The Barbarinus supports projects focused on tree planting and transplantation techniques and the improvement of tree varieties for urban conditions to include investigations into root and soil science. We have five scholarship lines available and amounts have increased to the three to $5,000 range. The Ohio chapter ISA education grant will be our only education grant in 2019. All education grants and scholarships and scholarship recipients will be announced in June. To see all the research we've funded through the years, I encourage you to go to the research archives page of our website. You can search by keyword or scientist name and we have compiled lists of research projects by topic. After exploring our archives, you can find other information about Tree Fund on our website, including our upcoming webinar schedule and info on events like Tour de Trees cycling event. If you have any questions about Tree Fund, submit them in the chat box and they will be answered at the end of this webinar. And now is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Nina Basic has been a professor and program leader of the Urban Horticulture Institute at Cornell University for the past 38 years. She has been a member of the Board of Directors of the New York State Urban Forestry Council and is co-author of Trees in the Urban Landscape, a text for landscape architects and horticulture practitioners on establishing trees in disturbed and urban landscapes. 
In addition, Dr. Bazic has authored over 100 papers on the physiological problems of plants growing in urban environments, including improved plant selections for difficult sites, soil modification, including the development of CU structural soil, and improved transplanting technology. Nina co-teaches a course at Cornell University titled Creating the Urban Eden, which integrates the woody plant identification and use with landscape establishment techniques for, different, for difficult urban sites. She is a frequent invited speaker at national conferences and workshops, and recently received the Alex Shigo Award for Excellence in Arboricultural Education from the International Society of Arboriculture. Thank you for being our, pres our presenter today, Dr. Basic. I'm gonna turn this over to you now. So, oh, you got it. Okay. Yeah. Looks good to me. Okay. Oh, well, so thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. And I'm um, just so glad to see so many people on this uh, webinar. It's always fun to see where people are coming from. And uh, also it speaks to the fact that we have these problems of soil issues, compacted soils all over the world. It's not just a North American thing, so it happens everywhere. So what I'd like to do today is to talk about um, strategies for dealing with uh, compacted soils that are compromised by urban construction. I'd also like to, before I get started, to um, uh, shout out to my graduate student, Miles Sachs, who did most of this work. And in fact, most of our work, the research that gets done is done with the aid of uh, wonderful graduate students. So Miles was a big part of this presentation. Put move your cursor over here. You know, uh, this quick on my screen. You know, your, uh... Okay. Okay. So um, you know, urban soils are seriously com uh, compromised by all kinds of development and. You know, you look at this site and you say, well, you can just clear off the debris and they'll be fine. But in fact, what happens before the debris is put on and all the materials is that a material, big machinery comes and compacts the soil and really destroys a lot of the structure of the soil. So just the surface uh, skin is not what's happening underneath. And so what we're going to be looking at is uh, dealing with these different problems. So primarily what I'd like to uh, talk about are these different strategies. Uh, first of all, uh, if anybody uh, read into my uh, last webinar in December talking about construction damage, uh, always best to protect the soil before it gets damaged. So protecting soil prior to construction is a big strategy. And then we need to calculate soil volumes for what we want to uh, grow. I mean, it's not just good enough to plant, uh, dig a hole and plant a tree in compacted soil. We have to create a site that's going to be amenable to uh, plant growth. Uh, third, we have a, there's a strategy called creating breakout zones or paths to better soil from bad soil to better soil. And that's kind of, uh, sometimes the site allows you to do that, which is a, a neat way of looking at it. We can use raised landscape planting beds to create a shared rooting space. and burying, basically burying poor soil, and raising the planting space up. And there's also what we call amending in place, what we call the scoop and dump strategy, which I'm uh, going to spend more time on that. That's what we've done. We've had a lot of research on this technique, and I'd like to share that with you. And then there's also, of course, replacing the soil, which we're not going to dwell too much on, but that is something that, uh, and sometimes you have to replace the soil, but uh, from a sustainability plant standpoint, we'd love to be able to not bring in soil from somewhere else and just to use what's on site. So these are the different points I'm going to be making and we'll get right into it. Okay, so um, typically uh, the critical root zone, we talk about that area that you want to protect during construction. 
is a one foot radius for every inch of DBH. So if you have an example below, you see a 21 inch diameter tree. You take call inches feet and say a 21 foot radius all around the tree. So a 42 foot diameter um, would be protected to not only protect the, uh, the roots, but also the soil that those roots are growing in. And if you will have a really specimen tree that is it's very, very special, you might want to up that to one and a half feet for every inch of DBH for specimen trees. So I can't stress this enough. It's always better to protect than to come and have to remediate. So if you can do it, do it. It's definitely the best way to protect trees. <clears throat> and we see the effects of soil volume. Um, this is a pretty well-known site here, it's in Washington, D.C. And those trees on the left in a large volume of soil, the trees on the right in vaults that are actually suspended from the sidewalk. And you can see the difference in these willow oak growth, um, both planted at the same time. And basically you're seeing a difference in soil volume, which translates into water, nutrients, oxygen for those trees. So we want to have a, the best soil volume we can to allow trees to grow. So how much soil does a tree need? Now this, uh, I'm gonna give you uh, just a few slides about this because we've done a lot of work on trying to figure out the volume needs of trees in different parts of the world and different parts of the country where there are different soils and different rainfall. But for most of the East Coast and Midwest, um, you can get away with two cubic feet of soil for every square foot of crown projection. Now, crown projection is just the area under the drip line. So nothing fancy about that. And we can calculate the area under the drip line as a circle. And basically, pi r squared gives you the area of that circle under the drip line. And if you think about that drip line as or the square footage and multiply it by two, you can get basically two cubic feet for every square foot of crown projection. Now, this is a, an oversimplification and maybe a Megan will invite me over some another time to talk about how you actually size soil vine for tree growth. But this is the, the nutshell version of this. And if you had a tree, let's say, uh, which had a uh, 20 foot diameter, but maybe a 10 foot radius and just do pi times the radius, you have, let's say, 314 squared feet and you divide, if you multiply that by two, let's say 300 times two is 600 cubic feet, or let's say 20 by 20 by 18 inches would give you the amount of soil you need to grow a tree of that size. So you're not, the, the tree you plant is not gonna be that size, but if you wanna protect or remediate amount of soil to grow that size tree, this is about the amount of soil you might need to do so we're just not digging a hole and planting a tree if, in fact, you have compacted soil. <clears throat> but of course, if you have a columnar tree, the, uh, the crown projection is going to be much smaller than what you see in a round-headed or a lollipop type tree. So in this case, if you have a, com a columnar tree with a very small crown projection, you would use the expected critical root zone as your soil preparation zone. And in this case, you'd say, well, I want to grow a tree that's going to get to, let's say, 15 inch DBH. So you figure about uh, a radius of 15 feet, uh, a diameter of 30 feet that you would prepare to allow this tree to grow to that size. So the volume effects on tree growth, uh, you can see this everywhere. You start looking around the trees in the urban environment. Here we see on the right-hand side, um, honey locusts planted in tree pits in sidewalk, and those on the left-hand side also planted in tree pits in sidewalk. But what's happened, what's happened, why the trees on the left are growing so much better is that I would ask you, if I would see you in the audience, I'd say, why is that? And you can say, well, those trees on the left-hand side are making a break out of the tree pit area uh, into that green space on the left side because that's a really good strategy for getting trees to have more volume is that you can make a breakout into a larger soil volume. Here's another example of uh, 
little leaf lindens growing on either side of the street and the one on the left is doing really well, also planted in the sidewalk. The one on the right is on its last legs and doing very poorly. Uh, and you say, well, what's going on here? The one on the right basically is a compact, this basically restricted root zone. And uh, this is an example of what it might look like in terms of underground. But the one on, on the left, you can start to see, well, the tree is off to my left. You can't see it, but you see some slight raising of the sidewalk here. And here the tree is doing what it can to get more soil volume. Here's the tree on the right hand side of your slide. And there's a slight raising of the sidewalk. And what, I'm, what you're looking at is my friend Gary Rafael, who's an arborist, who's using a ground penetrating radar um, equipment to locate roots uh, that have gotten from that tree under the sidewalk and into that green space. So we can detect roots there. and We know the tree has made a break for it under the sidewalk into that green space. And that's one way you can get a lot more volume. Of course, the problem with trees uh, as they get bigger and sidewalks is that we get uh, problems like this. Uh, tree roots, which are very superficial under pavement because of the need for compacting that pavement, uh, that, so that soil, and allows roots just to be at the very superficial area. And as they grow, as they radially grow, they typically leave the sidewalk and cause problems, trip hazards, and so on. So that's not a great solution either, although this is the tree is wanting to grow out of its restricted tree lawn and into a larger volume of soil. So what can we do to uh, accommodate these trees without causing problems? So this is uh, the breakout area idea. So here we see on the sidewalk, you can see two uh, concrete flags that are newly placed, the five by five feet uh, each flag. And we took those concrete flags up and we dug down uh, 24 inches and put structural soil in there, compacted it, and then repaved. And this is a safe passage, if you like, for those tree roots uh, to get under the sidewalk without heaving it and into somebody's front yard or green space that might be adjacent. So we think this is a, you know, a pretty minimal effort to try to reduce sidewalk heaving and, and allow trees to get more volume. So this whole breakout zone area is a, a thing you can think about when you're planting. Are there adjacent uh, green spaces or churches or houses or somewhere you can safely channel the roots into another green space? Um, and no one needs to know. So the tree is getting what it needs. It's growing and yet it's not being restricted into that narrow tree lawn between the sidewalk and the curb. So soil, we're gonna get into how do you change the soil instead of just borrowing soil from somewhere else, how do you actually deal with soil that's been compacted and to get something like this. This is, I always say this is a really complex uh, uh, scientific <laughs> picture where we basically have clumps and spaces. Clumps where water is being held and nutrients are being held, clumps of soil and spaces where water can drain away and oxygen can come, come through. So this is the good stuff. This is what we'd like to be able to have to grow trees and very often we don't have that. So how can we get it? So soil compaction during construction, uh, lots to talk about this, but I did it last December, so I'm not gonna talk about it, but basically when you have staging areas that are, have machinery that's going back and forth over the soil, where this is left to be uh, unchecked, uh, you have tremendous amount of compaction. And that's where the soil structure is being destroyed. And so we have something like this, where the soil is brick-like, where roots cannot penetrate, where water cannot drain, where there's no microbial activity, where the soil is basically almost dead. And we have to be able to remediate this kind of soil to allow trees to grow. So it's first really important to know what you've got. Um, I'm a big proponent of, of site assessment, knowing what the soil is like, what your conditions are like, what the above ground conditions, but also most importantly, what the below ground conditions are. And at Cornell University, you have a, a soil health test instead of just a soil test, which deals with chemical aspects, nutrients and pH and so on. 
but we look at the three aspects of soil health, which are the physical aspects, the biological aspects, and the chemical aspects. And we like to test soil from all these three uh, parameters to get the, an understanding of what the soil health is like. And so it's important to, uh, to know this before you're going in or after the construction has happened, if you could not protect your soil, what is the soil like now when you're trying to put a, a new landscape in that site? So just an example of uh, what you might get from a Cornell soil health assessment. You see on the left side, there's the physical in blue, the biological in green, and the chemical in yellow. And it used to be that I'd get, uh, people would say, uh, I I've had a soil test done and I'd get the soil test and it basically was dealing with the chemical aspects of the nutrients that were available in the soil. As you can see from this rating, which uses stoplight colors, you know, red is bad, yellow is poor, and green is good. Uh, if you just looked at the chemical aspects of the soil, you'd say this soil is pretty good. I mean, it's got lots of phosphorus, potassium, the minor elements are fine. Uh, I, the pH just says it's bad, but in fact, in urban environments, pH is just what it is, and you just plant according to the pH as opposed to saying it's bad. Uh, so I, this is done for field crops, and we're going to be modifying this for urban landscapes. But for the moment, um, you can see that the chemical aspects are pretty good. But when you look at the physical aspects and the biological aspects, you see a lot of red. You see a lot of poor conditions. And the physical aspects I generally work on first because if your plant can't get into the soil, if the plant roots can't grow there, well, it might as well not be there. I and mean, you don't really concern about the chemical aspects or the biological if the plant roots cannot uh, grow into that space. So it's really important to look at the surface hardness, uh, the available water holding capacity, uh, subsurface density, aggregate stability. All these things are really important to allow roots to grow or not to grow. When we get into the biological, we not to think about organic matter basically feeding the microorganisms. We have proxies for amount of microbial activity we have, and you can actually look at root pathogen pressure. If you have some negative pathogens, they're gonna cause problems to roots. You can look at respiration of the microorganisms and that fraction of organic matter, which is called active carbon, which is the food source for the microbial activity there. So these are really interesting and very important as ways to look at soil other than just the chemical aspect. So here's a site, this is the Cornell University that uh, uh, has more construction on it than anywhere else I know. But uh, you can see that this was a, the Ag Quad, this man library was redone. And we're gonna look at some of the uh, projects we've done on that site and how we've modified the soil, remediated the soil to allow that to be a really beautiful place right now. So this is, uh, you can see on the left, there's a lighter colored brick, and this is a new addition. On the right, there's an older building, and between these two is this kind of triangular space. This was a washout station for the, when the new building was being built. So there's a hole that was dug, and trucks used to wash out their debris and clay and all kinds of nasty things into this site, and then it was just kind of covered over and some uh, lawn put on top. And we were asked to build a landscape on this site, uh, very shady, but also the soil. We needed to know what the soil was like because you really can't tell just by looking at the surface. So first thing we noticed, this is something you can notice in the field, and I expect some of you have seen this, is this mottled color, uh, particularly the blue-gray color of the soil. The blue-gray color indicates there's no oxygen. Uh, when you get into more rust color, you have iron being oxidized and getting more orange or uh, yellow color. But when it's blue or gray, it's an indication that there's just no oxygen uh, in the soil. And that deal, that's because the soil is so compacted, there's no drainage. And drainage and oxygenation are inextricably linked. You have to have drainage in order to oxygen to come in. So this is uh, something we see that's a very big indicator of uh, poor soil. And then this is the same site. You know, we get the soil just did not drain. We have terrible clay. This is all that washout area that was done 
when the soil was being, uh, when that site was being constructed. And it got, it went from bad to worse. Uh, we did a perk test on this site. Uh, this is just showing it after rain, the fact that it's not draining. But we did some perk tests, dug some holes, pour some water in, and try to look at how many inches per hour you had drainage. And we came back and a week later, it was still sitting there. So virtually no drainage on the site, very, very compacted soils and clay texture to boot. So very, very difficult site. So what we decided to do uh, is to scrape off some of this pretty heavy soil and spread it on an asphalt pad. And we brought in uh, about 50%, so one-to-one -one soil to compost and mix it with a front end loader on an asphalt path so we could actually get a kind of one-to-one -one compost to soil mixture. And we came back to the site and we built up mounds or islands on this pretty awful site here. So you see some of the soil being put back. And you can see here also uh, some of the islands being put and where we had paths, we were not going to uh, remediate the soil because that's where the paths were and so on. So we saw just, uh, uh, we had just ton stone dust there. But the, the mounds were getting big and we started to plant. This was back in 2004, by the way. And that first year, there was a kind of awful sculpture in the back. We'll talk about that. But uh, so some of the plants, just the first, season after planting we have various different herbaceous and woody plants but a couple of years later this is what we started to see uh, the where we had the mounds the plants were growing exceptionally well we had those paths where it was not remediated but the mounds or the islands we created uh, were highly remediated and the important thing here is we would mulch this every year to allow it to get more organic in until we had canopy closure. I'll mention this again, where you have canopy closure where the leaves are touching the leaves of another plant, uh, and then when the leaves fall, they actually create their own mulch. So it's important to maintain that ingress uh, influx of organic matter during the period where it's growing. So here's that same site. Uh, even for narrow beds where we made uh, islands there, the plants are growing exceptionally well. And it's still growing well. It's now uh, you know, 14 years later and the plant the site is actually beautiful. So this is uh, remediating soil off-site, bringing it back, making island beds. And it worked very well. In the case where the soil, the site was so, uh, so bad, we had to do that. But we'll talk about other aspects too. So um, Miles Sachs, my graduate student, uh, did his PhD with me and just finishing up now, uh, took on the whole aspect of what happened to these soils after we started doing it in 2001 and we went to 2012 in his study, although we've continued to do it uh, since then. We had been doing this kind of remediation with organic matter and uh, I'd always been told that if you add so much organic matter, compost or whatever, you're going to have subsidence because the organic matter is going to uh, be uh, oxidized, it's going to be uh, basically go away, and so you'll have subsidence where the organic matter was. Well, people have been using organic matter to improve soils for eons, and I thought, well, there's got to be something else we can do to prevent the subsidence or the loss of the organic matter. And so we, in the blue areas on campus, this is where we did our scoop and dump technique, which is amending in place. And the red areas were the unamended sites adjacent to this, where we were going to look at uh, what the soil conditions were there. So this is, in a nutshell, this is what scoop and dump is. Uh, we basically, on a compacted site, we apply a layer of six to eight inches of compost to a compacted soil just on top. We use a backhoe bucket to dig down to 18 inches and the bucket is lifted with the topsoil compost mix three feet into the air, and then it is dropped. Hence, scoop and dump. Soil compost mix is dropped onto the ground and smooth. Landscape plants are directly planted into the soil. 
and the surface is mulched every year to replenish organic matter until we have canopy closure. So it's, it's almost, uh, you know, it's so simple, <laughs> but it works. We have now uh, quite a lot of data of many, many years. And I'll show you some of the results we've had. So it's gonna be a little bit of data here to show you. So this was, oh, this was the, you know, one of the sites we had to deal with after the, all the truck to, trucks and uh, trailers and material was, uh, we left the site, the campus said to us, oh, make a landscape on this site. So yes, we did. Um, but I wanna point out here that there are two large trees on the entrance to this library. And it's important when you're doing scoop and dump to protect the roots of these trees. So just as we were doing construction, we use the critical root zone to basically protect the roots of the trees so we don't scoop and dump right into the tree roots. You can kill trees pretty fast by doing that. So we would flag out where the tree, a critical root zone of the trees were, and we would not scoop and dump close to those roots. So here we are scooping and dumping on Cornell campus. And again, it's important, you know, certain technique things you want to scoop and dump away from the sites. You're not running over this, the site that you've just uh, amended or remediated. You want to make sure you're working outwards so all the soil is, uh, um, is being affected but not, not recompacting it. So what we're creating here basically in this compacted soil is we're creating veins of compost that are spacing the clods of compacted soil apart. And so you have these veins of compost running through the compacted soil. So it's not uh, homogeneous, it's heterogeneous. You have veins of compost, you have compacted soil. But uh, we've been doing this for many years now and we've got some good results based on this. So let me show you some of the um, tests we did to basically look at the health of the soil after we've used this technique. Uh, a great test that's uh, used at Cornell Health Test is the, called the Aggregate Stability Test. And what you're seeing in these two sieves is basically soil is put on, sieved and put onto the sieve. Uh, and then a simulated rainfall event you can see on the left is rained on this soil. And the amount of uh, aggregates that basically disassociate and melt through the sieve means that those aggregates are not stable. Uh, the one on the 22 stability saying that 22, uh, 80, 88% of the soil basically melted through the sieve and uh, became back to primary particles, sand, soil, and clay. We're on the right-hand side, the same rainfall event, and you had 72% uh, stability. So only a small percentage of the soil melted through the sieve into primary particles. So those uh, show you those are aggregated particles. They're giving us better pore space, better water holding capacity, better oxygenation. And so aggregate stability is a key aspect of soils because you don't want to have those soils just dissociate back into sand, silt, and clay. You want them to be aggregated into peds or crumbs, which are going to give you better porosity, infiltration, and aeration. So in terms of our scoop and dump, this is all the sites we looked at. You can see the aggregate stability of the scoop and dump soils over from a zero to 12 years. Uh, aggregated was 70% uh, of the soil was still aggregated, which was extraordinary because I was, was told, I was learned that aggregation takes a long time. Well, it doesn't take that long uh, to get some aggregation of the soil, which is when you have uh, microorganisms and roots exuding substances which actually glue sand, silt, clay, and organic matter together into those peds or clumps. The unamended soil, which was not, uh, was compacted but not amended had about you know, 35 percent uh, uh, of stable aggregates, so a very low percentage of stable aggregates. So organic matter is, uh, of course, we're adding organic matter. We're giving a big shot of organic matter to the soil when we're doing the scoop and dump, and uh, that has a big effect on many things down the line. So organic matter scoop and dump about, it became about 8 uh, percent by weight. Uh, versus unamended about 3% by weight. So not surprising, we're adding a lot of organic matter and that's what you get. 
But the important thing to think about in, in ag, uh, organic matter is there's a fraction, which is called active carbon. Of the organic matter, a fraction is called active carbon. And that's what's readily available as a food source for microorganisms, fungi, uh, all kinds of bacteria and so on. And the, um, the microorganisms of the soil uh, are eating this active carbon and multiplying and becoming uh, much more numerous in the soil if you have a good fraction of active carbon in your total organic matter. So again, here's our active carbon versus our in scoop and dump versus unamended. So we have basically threefold increase in active carbon in our uh, scoop and dump versus the unamended site. And available water holding capacity, not surprising with uh, uh, more organic matter, we're getting a higher available water holding capacity. That's the available water after excess water is drained away. Uh, what's available to the plant. So again, an increase in available water holding capacity. Now, potentially mineralizable nitrogen is basically a proxy for looking at the microorganism activity in the soil. And this is where active carbon is so important because if we have the active carbon, we're gonna be feeding those microorganisms. And here you can see the incredible uh, increase in, in microorganisms, if you like, uh, with scoop and dunk versus unamended soil. So this is a big issue because it's the microorganisms are doing the heavy lifting and making those uh, the soils, the nutrients available and helping with aggregation of soil particles. We also do uh, resistance and looking at how dense the soil is and we use in the field, we use a penetrometer, which is a simple tool, which as you press it into the soil measures pounds per square inch, and we don't want to get uh, above 300 PSI because that's the same level where roots cannot penetrate. So it gives you a depth of rooting, basically. This is a, three, a one meter stick, and it's divided into uh, increments, and you can see how far it goes before you hit this wall of 300 PSI where roots can't go. So it gives you a depth of rootable space, which is useful. And here, looking at scoop and dump, we had uh, basically uh, almost a threefold increase in penetration uh, with uh, scoop and dump versus the unamended soil. Bulk density, we do, the soil health test doesn't do this, uh, but we do it as well in the field as an urban site. This is another way of measuring compaction, is the density or the weight uh, per volume of anything is the density. And we look at the bottom, you'll see uh, for a sandy soil, you have a, a root limiting bulk density, which is about 1.7, and a sandy and silty clay, silk and clay soil, about 1.4 grams per cubic centimeter is root limiting. So we can take an undisturbed sample and with a known volume and dry that soil and find out the weight per volume and gives us the density. And that's a big thing that I, I, I spend a lot of time looking at is the density of soil and how much roots can actually penetrate given the density of soil. So with bulk density, you really want a lower bulk density. So an improved bulk density is one that's gonna be lower, less weight per volume. And scoop and dump are bulk density and aggregate was 0.89 and unamended uh, 0.47, which in our silky clay soil, which root limiting. So basically we're at a, above the threshold where roots could not go, but in scoop and dump, we were, had a, a density that allowed roots to grow. So this, um, to show you a little bit over time. So this, the, the graphs you saw, the bars you saw were basically all the samples we took uh, from 2001 to 2012 and uh, the mean of those to show you the, the differences. But I was really interested in how this works over time because um, my hypothesis was that the first time you do the scoop and dump and you've broken up the, uh, the clods and you add organic matter, it's going to be the best from the point of bulk density. You're going to have the loosest, less dense soil condition. And you do have an effect right away. But I was interested to see, well, we, you know, we get in there, we prepare the bed, we plant, we add organic matter over time, and how we won't get in there again to do this kind of digging. It's just a one-time deal. 
And then what happens over time? And so this was kind of really interesting to me. So, uh, so at the bottom, you'll see years since remediation from zero, like we did it yesterday, to 12 years ago. And we see both density. Again, in our soil, 1.4 was a root limiting bulk density. And you can see right away, time zero, we are below that 1.4 level. But over time, which was shocking to me, over time, we're actually getting a reduced bulk density. And why is this? We think it's because of increased aggregation, uh, spacing those particles aside with organic matter. We're actually acting, the organic matter is being utilized by microorganisms and creating greater, greater porosity. And so it's actually increased over 12 years. We get better or increased or lower bulk density, which is better than we did right at the beginning. So it's pretty, pretty interesting. Also an active carbon, that fraction of organic matter which is feeding the microorganisms over time from zero to 12 years, we have more active carbon uh, for microorganisms than we did just when we started. We had some, but we, when we started, uh, the microorganisms were actually had to break down the, uh, the carbon sources into more simple forms. We had uh, more active carbon that uh, became available to feed those microorganisms. And also potentially mineralizable nitrogen. It's a, again a proxy for looking at microorganisms in general. So over time, we're getting a much greater increase in the microorganisms in the soil, which uh, is also a very uh, encouraging aspect to this technique. Because we thought, well, we do it once and it's going to get worse from there. In fact, it gets better over time. So this is a site we come back to where we were have asked them to um, build a landscape on the site and we did the scoop and dump. Uh, and this is the first year after the uh, landscape went in and this is a few years later. And this was last year, same site. This is actually a, a sustainable sites accredited landscape, one of the first 11 that was accredited in the United States. And so it's, although it's only 7,000 square feet, uh, it is a site sustainable landscape and it's doing very well. Where we, what we did initially was we did the scoop and dump, we planted appropriate plants for that soil type and we mulched. And we mulched until we get what we call canopy closure and then we stop mulching. So when the tree, the roots are, are creating their own mulch, we don't rake the leaves out of the beds. They are organic matter, we wanna keep those in. So scoop and dump, uh, so basically re uh, decreases soil resistance, that penetrometer, increases pore volume by aggregation, reduction in bulk density, increases carbon and nitrogen in the soil, improves soil structure, aggregate stability, and improved plant growth response, and long-term improvement of soil conditions and plant growth over a 13-year study. Because we continue to do this and we continue to see this a response. So one question I, I get, which is a valid question, is well, what compost? I mean, what are you supposed to use? I mean, there are lots of different composts. And as all of us know who use compost, you can kill a plant pretty fast with the poor compost. But uh, in the last two years, I have a student, uh, Hannah Heyman, who's been looking at compost for using in the scoop and dump uh, technique. And so we did a bioassay, which is looking at plants growing in various uh, types of compost. We had various feedstocks. We had food waste and, um, and yard waste. We had uh, wood chips, very coarse compost. We had food waste and we had manure-based compost. So many different food stocks, uh, feedstocks, sorry, that were used to make compost. We narrowed it down to nine composts and we then mixed it with soil at uh, basically at these different percentages. No compost, a third compost, half compost, and 100% compost. So we grew these uh, beans in them as a bioassay to have the beans tell us how well they were doing in these conditions. And you see lots of differences in growth and chlorophyll capture and greenness and based on how these plants are doing in these compost mixtures. So uh, just a 
uh, initial look at a specification for compost that we did with our various different feedstocks is that we would allow a specification of a compost somewhere between 6.5 and 8, depending on soil pH. You may want to choose a, a lesser, uh, higher, P, a, a less high pH. But many of our soils here are, you know, in the 7 to 8 range. So uh, that I've never seen a compost which is really acid. But anyway, that's allowable pH, soluble salt contents, about 1 to 4 millimoles or decisiemens. Um, because we're basically going to mix this with soil. So four would be too high in a soil, but between one and four would be fine if you're mixing it with soil. Organic matter greater than 20%. And you might think that's low, but if you think about the weight of organic matter versus the weight of mineral soil, um, the soil is much heavier than organic matter. So if you're on a volume basis, that would be much, much greater than 20%, but it's done on a dry weight basis. That's why it's low, but greater than 20%, is fine. Uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio, anywhere from 10 to 1 to 20 to 1. The higher that first number gets, it gets woodier and woodier, and the potential for tying up some nitrogen becomes greater. So uh, anywhere from 10 to 1 to 20 to 1 is a good carbon to nitrogen ratio. And we have total nitrogen in the soil, in the compost, phosphorus, potassium. These are kind of levels we would say should be tested before you say this is a good compost to use. So just kind of uh, talk to you about some of the studies we did with plants in our scoop and dump uh, process. Here we have uh, looking at a site where we had the new planting and we had scoop and dump that and then out in the adjacent lawn which was very compacted we would compare the soils in those two and grow plants in them. Imagine that. So uh, here we are actually pounding a PVC uh, pipe into the ground to get an undisturbed sample of the unamended soil, taking the turf off first, and then we would easily get this, the pipe into the scoop and dump soil to get another uh, uh, pipe of soil to grow plants in. So here we are. Uh, these are our cores of amended or unamended soils. We put in uh, ficus benjamina just so we can grow it through the winter. We didn't even have to deal with dormancy. And uh, we grew them in a growth chamber and we measured certain properties of these. So the leaf area of these small trees was uh, almost twice as much with scoop and dump soil in these cores as in unamended soils. Uh, the dry weight of shoots, again, uh, quite a bit bigger, uh, larger amount in the scoop and dump versus the unamended soil. So this is a controlled environment in a greenhouse where we're actually looking at plant growth in response to these soil conditions that we've created. And at bulk density, again, we want to lower bulk density. Lower bulk density is better. So we have a scoop and dump soil bulk density of 0.9, whereas our unamended is 0.168, which is way higher than a root limiting uh, level should be. And what's interesting, looking at this graph here, you see the bulk density. It's not, we talk about thresholds, but it's really a continuum from uh, bad or dense soil to less dense soil. And you can see the, uh, the dry weight of shoots compared to the bulk density. Bulk density is on your uh, bottom axis and dry weight of shoots is on your left hand axis. And you can see the dry weight of shoots is much greater at lower bulk densities. And when you go above that threshold for rooting, the dry weight of shoots really goes down quite, uh, quite significantly. So that bulk density is a key factor to increase root growth and then shoot growth in these soils. So here we're looking at these uh, roots, which we've cut in the cores. You can see that uh, this is the compacted soil with that middle core, the middle roots were just basically the original core we planted. And the roots on the side was kind of where the roots couldn't access the bulk of that soil. So they kind of went along the surface and when it hit the sides of the core, they just went down the sides. So probably more root growth than we would have gotten had we not used these PVC cores. And this is the root growth in the scoop and dump soil. You can see the incredible root growth, the roots growing right through the aggregates, the aggregation of the soil. 
and a tremendous difference in root growth in the scoop and dump soil. So, um, at the end of this, I will show you a brief video, but I just wanted to show you, tell you one other technique which we've used, which is if you have a tree in a compacted soil and you want to amend the soil with the tree in place, you're not doing a, basically a scoop and dump, we've actually done radial trenching, which is also a useful thing to do. You can see a plan view and a, a section. We would come to a tree which was in a compacted site with a backhoe, intersect where the tree roots stopped, take the soil out, amend it with organic matter, put it back in. And then this is uh, some trees that were in a compacted um, fill and then some little leaf lindens and we had these funny little uh, mulch. <laughs> Uh, trenches, and of course, this was ridiculous from the point of view of mowing. So eventually, we just smoothed. We just made a big half circle around these trees with mulch because no one wanted to mow this. But these are our trenches uh, coming out from our trees. And then over time, this is five years later. The trees were growing really well, and of course, Cornell was going to put a new building on the site, so we had to take the trees out. But it gave us an opportunity to look at root growth. So here on the left, you see root growth when it hits those trenches that have been amended. The root grows really strong and you know, very vigorously, and the root between the trenches is very weak and uh, very poor root growth. Another example of a tree against a hot brick wall where the trees on the left are, uh, have drought deciduous avoidance mechanism for hot and dry conditions. We wanted to get them more water in the root zone. The first we did was take off the grass and we basically a radial trenching between those trees and then mulch the entire surface and that's what it looked like two years later. So getting roots into those soil volumes is the key to getting these trees to grow well. And of course it's now shading the, the brick wall so it's not being as stressed as well. So I'm just going to show you this uh, uh, short video. Of this is about. a production of Cornell University. So here you can see, uh, it's always great to have 40 students doing this work. Uh, and we've done, a lot of our students have done this work over time, putting in new landscapes. And here they are spreading the compost over uh, into bioswales, which were really compacted, putting about six inches of compost on. And of course, it always rains when we're doing this, uh, but they're hardy folks. And uh, after the compost is spread, we see the flags to uh, basically make sure that tree roots don't get hit. Here's the backhoe going down 18 inches and scooping and dumping the soil, creating those veins of compost. And it's pretty nasty soil. We've got pieces of concrete and asphalt, uh, but we just go right through it and uh, go down about 18 inches with this scooping and dumping process. And so then our students, we go in creating the Urban Eden, they then plant this, these bites. See how it's pretty rough. It's not rototilled, it's not made smooth, it doesn't need to be, because we're gonna mulch the surface anyway. So they then plant uh, appropriate plants for these soil conditions, meaning this pH has to be, the plants have to be right for the pH and the, and the moisture conditions. And this was done in April of 2014. And then we mulch the entire surface, about two to three inches of shredded bark mulch. It could be other things, but that's what we use here. Uh, so we don't want to just put a smattering, about two to three inches, but we don't want to bury the trees either. The planting is complete. This is uh, end of April, 2014. These are three connected bioswales that were uh, planted and scooped and dumped first. So we'll just look at how this change over time. This is the initial planting, day one. So, so that was early April, now we are in September. So things are growing well. Not nearly at canopy closure yet. Plants are just still growing. So we would mulch this uh, in the early spring of the year. 
You can also see where the water from the parking lot is being drained into the bioswale. This is then 2015 July. You can see there's been a lot of growth here. And we're almost at canopy closure. The parking lot water is being channeled into these bioswales. And again, we're looking at you what know, the plant selection was important here in terms of some plants got really wet, other plants were on their shoulders, were in drier conditions. And uh, next summer, 2016, we're basically at canopy closure for most of these bioswales. So the shrubs are touching each other. We had some existing trees which we worked around and now they are enjoying the better soil as well. And so we think this has been a very successful project where we have very little weed pressure and the only things we really need to weed are the edges of the asphalt where uh, we don't get into that. So our, my last slide. So it's basically additional resources, questions. That, you know, there's a lot of information and I would urge all of you to be skeptical and questioning about the things you do in the landscape because uh, when someone says this is the easy fix, you know, tell them, show me the data. So that's what I tried to do today is show you the data. And we have papers and lots of information um, on these uh, different techniques, also the soil health manual, uh, how you can have your soil tested that way. And so I would urge, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Nina. Thank you. Um, we have about 40 questions, which I expected. Um, and it's, a, it's been about 58 minutes. So I'm gonna launch our poll right now. And if you wanna just throw that off the screen until you're ready to take it, feel free to do that. Um, I certainly understand just wanting to launch right into the um, questions with Nina, but um, please take that before you leave the meeting room. Okay, so let's get started. Um, Jason Bartow, we are using a cubic yard of biochar and a cubic yard of composted organic matter using the scoop and dump method to remediate a 10 by 10 site to plant a bare root tree that has spent time in our Utah gravel bed nursery. Could we be using too much biochar or too much organic matter? Our base soil is alkaline clay cobble rock. So you're using a one-to-one -one biochar to compost? Is that yeah, right? yeah. Into how much of that is going into, what, how much soil is there? He said a 10 by 10 site to plant uh, bare root trees. Right, so I'm, I'm not clear about how much soil is being mixed with the biochar and compost. Right, right. Um, maybe, he'll, maybe he'll chime in a little bit. Um, and Jason, you can clarify that at the end of the answer and ask another question and then I'll grab that and we can clarify. Um, do you ever recommend the addition of mycorrhizae on severely compacted or stripped soils? Well, um, mycorrhizae in some cases might be useful if it's the right mycorrhizae for the tree type but it does not deal with the physical aspects of compaction. So this is where I would be skeptical and saying, you know, there's a lot of people trying to sell you things out there, but unless you deal with the physical compaction issues, mycorrhizae will not help. Okay. Um, our arbor practice is located in Illinois. Can we submit soil samples for a Cornell soil health assessment? And what is the cost on that? Absolutely, you can send soil samples from anywhere. Uh, there are three base levels of uh, packages, uh, anywhere from $60 for a base, to about 110, or extended if you want heavy metals and more tests, you can get to about 150 or so dollars per cent. And, and is that the only place that does that sort of test? Somebody um, was curious about other labs in the Midwest that do a similar test, or is well, it? You'd have to ask, I'm not familiar. I mean, this is becoming more the norm for uh, progressive soil testing labs to look at these uh, physical, biological, and chemical issues, but I'm not familiar with how many there are, so you can check that out. Okay, um, so these questions kind of are specific and they go back to the beginning of your talk, so it, it's, it, I'm not quite sure what they're referencing and if we're not sure we'll just go on, but Naomi asks, um, since we were talking about construction, there was probably a design phase before the build. I'm not sure specifically what build Naomi is referring to. 
why wasn't this washout site, oh, the washout site, better protected through the design planning phase? Why was planting it an afterthought rather than protecting it during the build? Good question. Why wasn't it? It should have been. So there were plenty of situations, I'm sure you situation where we're planting an afterthought. You expect there to be planting, but it's like, no, nobody's protecting the trees, and there's all this damage that happens. And of course, it should be done. There should be planting beforehand with protection of soil and trees before the, the backhoes get on site. Okay. Um, can you talk more about the neighboring plants you were talking about when you were showing us the mounds, that mounding planting site? Um, I'm not sure if specifically she wants to know what kind of plants they were or... No, they were mostly woody plants. There were some herbaceous plants. It was a very shady site. We had some uh, hackanocloa grass, which is a great grass for uh, shady sites. We had some ferns. We also had uh, hydrangeas. I mean, we had a lot of different plants there. Uh, we had some uh, Ilex uh, crania, sky pencil. You saw those tall ones. Um, and then we had some atrium palmatum, uh, Japanese maple. We had some, <laughs> just remembering from, from my memory what plants we had there, we have... Um, uh, well, it certainly would change. Yeah, Thuya Placata is a great evergreen for shade, western arborvitae. We had some of that as well. Um, would you handle everything the same if, if you had compaction from snow? Um, snow compaction from heavy, wet, 10-foot set snow from the wintertime? Yeah, I would, uh, if you have that, sometimes we do get the big mounds of where parking lots are, you know, putting all the snow in one place and you do get compaction. I would definitely, uh, uh, you know, do that scoop and dump if that was the case. I would test it first to know what the level of compaction was before I would go ahead and do it. Some people were saying NRCS or other county extension agents can help with lo local soil sample tests. Um, Duh, I'm at the Utah State University Land Grant University, so we clearly do that as well. I'm just not sure the extent at which um, it matches the site, the kind of tests you guys do at Cornell. Um, scoop and dump method uses what type of mulch? Oh, we use uh, shredded bark, which is our cheap mulch here, but it, uh, as long as it's an organic mulch, uh, there's no reason why it can't be something else. Uh, we do not use Compost is a mulch. Uh, we don't grow plants directly in compost. It has to be mixed with soil. But shredded bark, anything organic that will break down, uh, it should be fine. Um, in scoop and dump, what if what if you what if as you scoop you get large clods of in situ soil? Does the operator break up the clods or just leave them? And how small? Well, we try to do it when the soil is not soaking wet. So you get some fractioning of the clods. Um, you know, I, I guess I would, you know, if the, the pouring rain and you have soggy soil and you're just sitting water sitting there, I guess I'd wait to do scoop and dump until that had dried out a bit because you will get, uh, you won't get the, the breaking of the clods as well as when it's dry. Any alternative restoration techniques to scoop and dump um, under the drip line? Uh, well, you know, again, look at the December. We talked about using uh, air spades to uh, create trenches and then put basically compost in those trenches. And that, in case that, especially if a tree is a little bit younger, that seems to work when the tree is really old. Um, I've not seen a lot of re uh, good results with that, but using an air spade or air excavation tool can reduce compaction under a tree. And then as long as you add compost, to the trenches you create that uh, might be useful. Do you ever add sand to the scoop and dump operation? I never add sand. Um, to add sand to a heavy soil, you'd have to add a, an enormous amount of sand to actually change the texture of the soil. And uh, what people have done in the past is they add a little bit of sand thinking it's going to lighten the soil up or create better drainage. In fact, it's worse until you get above 50% sand in a given amount of soil. So that's a tremendous amount of sand to use and we don't use that. What's, what's um, you might not know this off the top of your head, but what sieve size is used on your ag stability test? Oh gosh, uh, I'm not sure exactly. But it's, it's in the lab, in the manual, it's, it, it describes the sieve size. 
Do you spread compost on top of the soil before you administered the scoop and dump trials? Yes, yes. it's just you've got comp compacted soil, you put this, you know, the compost on and then you do the scoop and dump with the backhoe moving away as you go so you're not recompacting the soil. Any thoughts on scoop and dump in drier climates like Utah, where many species require low, lower levels of organic matter in the soil? Uh, you know, my experience is mostly in the uh, Midwest Northeast, so I wouldn't uh, suppose, expect to know as much about drier sites. But, uh, you know, if it's dry, the organic matter is not going to make it wet. It's just going to make it looser. So if you don't get rainfall, the organic matter will still reduce the density of those compacted soils. I think it's worth a try. When you say aggregation occurs relatively quickly with organic matter, what does that mean temporally? Well, over a period of 12 years, we had tremendous increase in aggregation um, based on the in that big shot of organic matter increases the micro microorganism population, which helps to aggregate the soil the primary particles with some organic matter into PEDs or clods or aggregates, which uh, happens fairly, fairly quickly as long as we get that big shot of organic in that first and then the microorganism population uh, balloons and we get some aggregation happening. If you can't get a backhoe into a site, would you get sufficient results by wheelbarrowing the compost in and then using a rototiller or fork? Oh, I, I don't use a rototiller. It only goes down about four to six inches at most. We have in the past, before we got the backhoe in there, we, uh, we wheelbarrowed the uh, compost in there, um, and then we use hands and shovels. Uh, but students, you know, they're good, but they can't get down 18 inches, but they went down about 12. So uh, you can do it by hand, but not a rototiller. Not a rototiller. You might have already answer answered this. What kind of compost do you recommend for the scoop and dump? Um, well, so I, 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 on this site, there is an uh, initial spec for a compost based on what we, our research in the past two years. So that is going to be coming out in a uh, easily accessible bulletin within the summer, but it's on the website. What type of irrigation do you use in the closed canopy sustainable landscape that you described following the dump, scoop and dump? Okay, so our... our uh, sustainable procedure is we irrigate the first year after planting and then basically uh, not again. Uh, so we aid in establishment with irrigation that first year if necessary. Of course this year we rain hasn't stopped so we haven't needed to irrigate mm -hmm. but um, we think about irrigation the first year and maybe the second year for trees and then after that in our climate we don't irrigate anymore. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on using biochar uh, for, for compaction remediation? Well, again, you'd have to get it in there. Uh, there's a lot of interest in biochar, um, and the research is not out yet. There are different types of biochar. Uh, I like our, our, our compost because it's a readily renewable resource. It's everywhere. People are having to, communities are having to, cities are having to compost their uh, the waste in order not to put it in the landfill. So I think that's a readily renewable resource. Uh, and it has a lot of nutrients in it, whereas biochar is not going to give you that nutrient uh, level. <clears throat> Should we take a few more questions or? I'm OK. OK, because um, there's a lot of questions left. <laughs> um, have you used biosolids in your compost mixture and is there any research in your opinion to help with this decision? Would it affect the texture in a negative way? We did not, we chose not to use biosolids as our feedstock for compost. Uh, that was a decision with a lot of variability in, in biosolids so we just chose to use feedstocks of uh, like yard waste, food waste, and manure. And uh, so I don't have any results on biosolids. What would be the effect of using compost versus manure in the remediation process? Uh, well, first of all, you have to have a compost that's mature. Uh, if you use straight manure, it's going to be very hot, very high in insoluble salts, and could actually burn 
uh, the plants. So we don't recommend any uh, waste product that's not been composted in the, in the best practices ways to be, create a stable compost. Straight manure is much too toxic for plants. Some of these questions are very specific. Um, have you seen any evidence of problems with compost becoming anaerobic in veins 18 inches deep in dense soils? We have not seen any anaerobic conditions in our scoop and dump soils. I mean, there is possible for compost if it's not uh, windrowed or aerated in, in the, while well, it's being made to become an anaerobic in the inside if that's not, if it's created in, an, in a poor way. So, but once we get the compost into the soil and create these clods and veins, um, we don't get anaerobic conditions. Um, Howard asked, can you provide a citation to a paper summarizing the results for study for the study of the six sites where scoop and dump was used on a campus? There, there's a there is this publication on my the last slide is the is from Urban Greening, Urban Forestry, Urban Greening 2017. There's a uh, paper that summarizes that exact study I was showing you on the campus. Howard, write that down then. Um, Are there studies that look at the effects of, of only top dressing with compost versus scoop and dump? Well, again, if you're, you top dress, that's kind of like mulching. I mean, if the soil, the bulk soil, the depth of soil is not, um, if it's too dense, you're not going to get root growth. So top dressing seems like uh, uh, just useless to me. Uh, you have to get the, you have to break up the density of the soil if you're going to be actually creating something useful. How deep do you d dig the trench? Somebody missed that. The trench. Well, I mean, we would go about 18 inches with the backhoe to scoop and dump. If we're talking about aeration with the uh, air spade. I think that might be the, yeah, the air spade yeah, aeration. That would probably go about eight to 12 inches. Okay. That's within an existing tree uh, area. Okay. Is there a suggested minimum maximum depth to excavate when performing scoop and dump? What factors influence this depth needed? Um, it seems like you probably answered that just, sorry. Sometimes there's so many questions I'm, I'm trying to get well, them all together. This is slightly practical in terms of the backhoe size and how deep it can go. So we sort of aim for 24, we were happy with 18 inches. Um, but I don't think we can get down, I mean, we have to we would have to scoop and dump and have to go down again before we can get lower than 18 or 24. It just is the uh, practicalities of the backhoe. And what about with clay, clay, uh, highly clay soils? Does that scoop and dump work with those? Absolutely. Uh, okay. we, we use a lot of scoop and dump with highly silky clay soils and it's worked very well. We probably up our percentage a bit more. So you can get away with anywhere from 25% to, you know, three scoops of soil to one scoop of compost, but we typically go two scoops of soil to one scoop of compost, which is a third. Uh, and if you had a really heavy clay, you might go up that as well, maybe 60-40 uh, in terms of more compost in a clay soil. Let's take a couple more here. Um, under the breakout zone of a sidewalk, you said you cut roots down to 24 inches. Um, is that recommended for all sizes of trees, including mature trees in a similar we parkway we situation? We cut roots down. We would. I don't. You, sorry, we cut. We take the soil down. We, we dig the soil out to 24 inches. Yeah, I think that's what they meant to say. Right. So, in the sidewalk situation, we take up a couple of flags of concrete. We dig down the soil to 24 inches. The roots are not there yet, and, and then they uh, we we repay, We put structural soil in, compact it, repave and then the roots go through, but at a lower level than they would typically where they stay at the surface of the concrete. Uh, that's a breakout zone there. So they go deeper in the structural soil to get into somebody's front yard. Is that clear? Yes, I'm just thinking about the sidewalk stuff we're working on in Utah. You know, I think that's a great place to stop. Okay. Well, Nina, you, I am just blown away every time you um, present to us. And I just really 
I want to express my gratitude because I know it's a lot of work for you to prepare these talks. And, um, you know, if you're willing to keep coming back, I'm willing to keep holding these webinars because um, you clearly are providing a wonderful service to all of these attendees today. So thank you everybody for joining us. Um, I appreciate you all sticking with us today. Please take the poll before you sign off and um, um, have everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye guys.